Chapter Three of Book Five of Les Miserables, Volume Five by Victor Hugo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Les Miserables, Volume Five by Victor Hugo, translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Book Five: Grandson and Grandfather. Chapter Three: Marius Attacked. One day, Monsieur Guillemond, while his daughter was putting in order the vials and cups on the marble of the commode, bent over Marius and said to him in his tenderest accent, Look here, my little Marius, if I was in your place, I would eat meat now in preference to fish. A fried sole is excellent to begin a convalescence with, but a good cutlet is needed to put a sick man on his feet. Marius, who had almost entirely recovered his strength, collected the whole of it, drew himself up into a sitting posture, laid his two clenched fists on the seat of the bed, looked his grandfather in the face, assumed a terrible air, and said, This leads me to say something to you. What is it? That I wish to marry? Agreed, said his grandfather, and he burst out laughing. How agreed? Yes, agreed. You shall have your little girl. Marius, stunned and overwhelmed with a dazzling shock, trembled in every lip. Monsieur Guillemand went on. Yes, you shall have her, that pretty little girl of yours. She comes every day in the shape of an old gentleman to acquire after you. Ever since you were wounded, she has passed her time in weeping and making lint. I have made inquiries. She lives in the Rue de l'Homme Armé, number seven. Ah, there we have it. Ah, so you want her? Well, you shall have her. You're caught. You had arranged your little plot. You had said to yourself, I'm going to signify this squarely to my grandfather, to that mummy of the Regency and of the Directory, to that ancient beau, to that Durante turned Durante. He has indulged his frivolities also, that he has, and he has had his love affairs and his grisettes and his cosettes. He has made his rustle. He has had his wings. He has eaten of the bread of spring. He certainly must remember it. Ah, you take that caught chaffer by the horns. That's good. I offer you a cutlet, and you answer me by the way I want to marry. There's a transition for you. Ah, you reckoned on that bickering. You do not know that I'm an old coward. What do you say to that? You are vexed. You do not expect to find your grandfather still more foolish than yourself. You are wasting this discourse which you meant to bestow upon me, Mr. Lawyer, and that's vexatious. Well, so much the worse. Rage away. I'll do whatever you wish, and that cuts you short, imbecile. Listen, I've made my inquiries. I'm cunning, too. She is charming. She is discreet. It is not true about the lancer. She has made heaps of lint. She is a jewel. She adores you. If you had died, there would have been three of us. Her coffin would have accompanied mine. I've had an idea, ever since you have been better, of simply planting her at your bedside but it is only in romances that young girls are brought to the bedsides of handsome young wounded men who interest them. It is not done. What would your aunt have said to it? You were nude three-quarters of the time, my good fellow. Ask Nicolette, who has not left you for a moment, if there was any possibility of having a woman here. And then what would the doctor have said? A pretty girl does not cure a man of fever. In short, it's all right. Let us say no more about it. All's done. All's said. It is all settled. Take her. Such is my ferocity. You see, I perceived that you did not love me. I said to myself, here now, I have my little cosette right under my hand. I'm going to give her to him. He will be obliged to love me a little then, or he must tell me the reason why. Ah, so you thought that the old man was going to storm, to put on a big voice, to shout no, and to lift his cane at all that aurora. Not a bit of it. Cosette, so be it. Love, so be it. I ask nothing better. Pray, take the trouble of getting married, sir. Be happy, my well-beloved child. That said, the old man burst forth into sobs, and he seized Marius's head and pressed it with both arms against his breast, and both fell to weeping. This is one of the forms of supreme happiness. Father, cried Marius. Ah, so you love me, said the old man. An affable moment ensued. They were choking and could not speak. At length the old man stammered. Come, his mouth is unstoppable at last. 
He has said father to me. Marius disengaged his head from his grandfather's arms and said gently, But father, now that I am quite well, it seems to me that I might see her. Agreed. Again, you shall see her tomorrow. Father! What? Why not today? Well, today then. Let it be today. You have called me father three times, and it is worth it. I will attend to it. She shall be brought hither. Agreed, I tell you. It has already been put to verse. It is the ending of the elegy of the Jeune Malade by André Chalet, by André Chalet, whose throat was cut by the ras by the giants of ninety-three. Monsieur Gelleman fancied that he had detected a faint frown on the part of Marius, who, in truth, as we admit, was no longer listening to him, and who was thinking far more of Crosette than of 1793. The grandfather, trembling at having so inopportunely introduced Ange Chenier, resumed precipitately. Cut his throat was not the word. The fact is that the great revolutionary geniuses, who were not malicious, that is incontestable, who were heroes, Pardi found that Ange Chenier embarrassed them somewhat, and they had him guillot. That is to say, those great men on the seventh of Thermidor besought Ange Chenier, in the interests of public safety, to be so good as to go. Monsieur Grimaud, clutched by the throat of it by his own phrase, could not proceed. Being able neither to finish it nor to retract it, while his daughter arranged the pillow behind Marius, who was overwhelmed with so many emotions, the old man rushed headlong, with as much rapidity as his age permitted, from the bedchamber, shut the door behind him, and purple, choking, and foaming by the mouth, his eyes started from his head. He found himself nose to nose with honest Basque, who was blacking boots in the anteroom. He seized Basque by the collar, and shouted full in his face in fury, By a hundred thousand javots of the devil, those ruffians did assassinate him. Who, sir? André Chenier! Yes, sir, said Basque in alarm. End of Book 5, Chapter 3